Are you a service-based business owner looking to increase profits to fund your lifestyle? Well, this podcast is for you. We bring you inspirational guests sharing actionable tips to solve many of the struggles you face each and every day. And now, over to your host, Paul Higgins. Welcome to the Build, Live, Give podcast. Great to have you here. If you're a first-time listener and you love what you hear, please subscribe. If you're a regular, thanks for your support. It means the world to me. So there will be lots, well, there is actually lots of great information in the podcast today. So if you want to take notes, by all means, do it. But there also will be a full transcribe at the end for you as well. So today's guest worked in finance in corporate and worked for the likes of Dell and had a wonderful career, then decided to to leave and set up his own business. And he was doing consulting for business owners and he wanted to create his own methodology and then his world changed. He read a book called Traction by Gino Wickman and now he's one of 400 EOS implementers around the world. And, you know, he gives so much value in this podcast and I ask him questions about the EOS system that you will not read in the book. So what are three key things that he does go through? One is he talks about a healthy business and he goes through exactly what are the components of that. Never heard it before. It was great. Then he talks about the three key measures that you should have for your business. And finally, he talks about the accountability and you know how you shouldn't have an organization structure. You should have an accountability structure. So he goes through that and it's great. If you're leading a team of people, this is a must listen to. And he also gives a great asset at the end, which is uh, an org checkup. So you can get that at the end of the podcast. So what I'll do now is hand you over to Don Maranka from JDSM Enterprises. Welcome, Don Maranka from JDSM Enterprises to the Build, Live, Give podcast. Great to have you here, Don. Thank you very much for having me, Paul. I'm excited. Yeah, well, I've got to get this out of the road quickly if you're watching it on YouTube. But yes, that is Don's actual office, right? He's in, <laughs> uh, he's in Texas and it's a magnificent looking office. And I thought it was just a Zoom back backdrop the first time I met Don. And then uh, 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 I think it was your wife um, walked past the left-hand side. So then I could realise, no, it actually is his office. So uh, look, that looks great. Yep. But uh, Thank we're, you. Here, we're here to talk to you today and how you help other uh, business owners, and you know, the first thing I always ask is, who do you help, and and what sort of problems do you help them with? You know, I work with a uh, primarily small and mid-sized business owners and their leadership team. So, what I what I eventually do basically is help them develop healthier businesses, um, and in essence, really helping them get more out of their business because a lot of times they're not getting everything that that they want out of it, and it's different for different people. You know, some people want freedom. Um, to to do a lot of other things outside of the business, people want a more um, you know systematized business and organization. P- some people want more culture related things. So whatever it is that they want, that's what we help them with. Great. And and what's your definition of a healthy business? Well, it's it's really I focus on three things. One is uh, clarity, accountability, and growth. So for me, a healthy business is. One that has clarity in both the personal side of things where the business owner is crystal clear on what their personal vision is, and also the company vision is crystal clear and everyone's aligned with that company vision because once everyone's clear with that, um, then they all know what they're fighting for, right? They, they have a bigger purpose on what they're doing, uh, what they're doing for their specific roles. They, exactly, they know exactly how it's tied to that bigger picture. Um, and the accountability is is really a healthy organization too, because without accountability and without discipline, you can't move towards that vision. Uh, or you're moving at a very slow pace and you're always, you know, getting um, uh, getting off the path um, because you don't have that clear vision and you're not executing really well. So accountability is really key. And then growth, I mean, obviously you want to have growth in your company, whether it's revenue and profit, but also a lot of leadership and personal personal growth. Um, when you have those three things, that to me is is a very healthy organization. That's where always we're always striving towards that. Great. And, and what are some of the obstacles getting in the way of achieving those three things with, you know, clients you come come to work with? You know, it's, it's very much like, because I look at the business as a body, right? It's an organizational body. So we have our own personal bodies that we try to live a, a, a lifestyle that's healthy. And, and the, uh, the obstacles that we get in our own personal life is that we get in our own way, right? Our own, our own headspace, our head trash. 
and our own bad habits and things like that. Same thing for an organization because an organization is a body when you look at it. But then, you know, the, the teams, the leadership teams, the managers and leaders, they get their own, in their own way too in terms of their headspace, their head trash, bad behaviors, bad habits and things like that. And so to me, that's the most common thing is that if we just get out of our own way, you know, the organization will, will function a lot better in a healthier way. Um, but we have to first start, start on ourselves as a leadership team and the owner of the organization to make sure that we're, we have a right, the right headspace, you know, the right attitude about running the business and owning the business so that we can really lead it to the next level and, and leave the legacy that we want to leave. Yeah, look, I find the same thing. Most of the people that I work with on sales strategy, you know, it always starts with themselves, their mindset first mm-hmm. and then in exactly the sounds like it's it's the same same for you and, and and what are some of the things you know about you know helping people get those three things that many people miss a lot of it is really communication um because that clarity when i talk about clarity and getting that that first of all personal clarity on the owner's own clear vision is that um you know they may have it clear in their head but they haven't written it down or haven't shared it with anybody else. And that's really where one of my models, um, the peer board uh, model, they share it with other business owners. So once, once they have clarity on that and they start sharing it with other business owners, it becomes more real to them and it becomes more tangible to them, especially when you share it because now that you're being held accountable to that, that personal vision, right? And, and there's others that are helping you get there. Um, from a leadership standpoint, beyond the owner's, you know, it's from a company standpoint, you have to have clarity in the company vision as well, not just a personal vision of the owner, but the company vision of the whole entire organization. Because if that's not clear and it's, it, that hasn't been communicated clearly, where everybody can actually visually, visually see it in their heads, you're not going to get there because you'll have different visions and people are going in different directions. And so it always starts with that clarity and that communication and, and, and communicating that clear vision with the whole organization. Yeah. And look, I know a lot of people, um, you know, including myself, find it h- hard to say, well, how long is that a uh, vision for the business? You know, is it a, you know, is it a five year, you know, like sometimes I'll hear people get on a podcast and say, I want to help a million people do whatever. And I'm like, well, mm-hmm. you know, I-, I find that a little difficult to then put a system in place to achieve that. Now, what's, right. yeah, w- w- what do you find around time frame? What's a, what's a good time frame? What's realistic when you help people work on, on their purpose and their vision? No, so we break it down. I mean, we break it down from uh, when, when I'm looking at the company vision uh, specifically, because we use a tool called the Vision Traction Organizer, the VTO, which is based on the book called Traction by Gino Wickman. So it's it's based on the EOS model, the Entrepreneur Operating System. And so this VTO breaks it down into your 10-year target, which is kind of like your big, hairy, audacious goal, right, by Jim Collins. 10-year um, target, and then we break that down to a three-year picture. And that three-year picture has a lot more granularity, has a lot more visual aspect to it, um, where you can see it in your mind's eye. Because if you see it in your mind's eye, you just naturally start going towards that, and you'll, all your efforts and intentions start moving towards that. And then we break that three-year picture down into a one-year plan. Uh, So what actually has to happen this year in order for us to move closer to that three-year picture? And then within that one-year plan, how do we break that down on a quarterly basis? So break it down into quarterly rocks, which is your quarterly priorities. And really, when you break it down that way, it's a lot easier to eat that elephant. If you're trying to get there 10 years from now, how do you do that three years from now? How do you do that one year from now? And what do we need to focus on for the next three months that helps us get there? And when you do that time and time again, and y'all just execute that that much better towards that, because, you know, studies have shown that humans, we can't, when we start thinking past three months, we freak out. We don't know how to eat that elephant one bite at a time. And so we, we don't do anything about it. But if, if we, if we look, you know, three months out and we have a bigger picture vision, that's clearly defined. And then we set out, okay, what's our priorities for these three months that we had to put our heads down, work on those, execute on that really well. We can focus on three months at a time. And when we do that, and we, we at the end of three months, we visit, we see how we did last quarter, see what, what successes we had, lessons learned, look at the big picture vision again and say, okay, now let's get back to the vision. What do we need to do the next three months to advance us even closer to that? And then again, put our heads down, work on that. And you do that every quarter. 
man, you'll execute towards that vision. You'll be surprised how much people get to that vision because they have these three month sprints and that discipline to accomplish those things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've read Gino's book. It's fantastic. Actually, I listened to it on Audible, to be honest. I haven't read it as yet. But um, mm-hmm. now, why did you pick uh, the EOS model? What what drove you to, to pick that out of all the models you could use? Yeah, interesting question. So I was actually developing my own model. So because I've been working with, with business owners for the last probably almost 12 years now, and uh, about into my third or fourth year uh, into doing that, um, I was I, I knew that just working strictly with the business owners, they're still going to struggle with implementing their strategy across the organization. And so, so I was looking for a model that I liked that looked at the business holistically um, and systematically. Uh, and I just didn't see anything like that. Uh, so I started creating my own uh, based on the whole business body aspect of things. And then someone gave me the book Traction. And once I read that book, it was so aligned with my philosophies and all the tools that have been used in it already. Um, Because Gino's brilliance was, you know, when you look at it, he didn't really create anything new. He used a lot of time-tested, proven tools that's been out there for years that's worked. But his brilliance was he created the framework that if you use it within that framework, those six key components of the business and use those tools that have been around for years, it just works really well. And that's why it works it works so well because he's simplified it, um, and I didn't have to create my own. So I decided to take the take the leap the leap and the plunge to become a certified EOS implementer, and went through the boot camp training in 2015. So. Great. And uh, so once you do the training, is there an ongoing fee to use the system? There is. There's a monthly fee because we have access to our our training modules and the materials that we buy for our clients. And we also have a, a quarterly collaborative exchange we call QCE, where we come together as EOS implementers and really sharpen our saw to make sure that we're delivering the EOS system as purely as possible, because that's that's where you get the, the most traction is when we're all consistently delivering it in the purest fashion. So Yeah, great. And look, I highly recommend if you haven't uh, read the book, listen to the audio, please do. It's a, it's a fantastic system. But, you know, you've been doing it now for, you know, quite a few years. What what are the things that you see and you know about EOS that, you know, you won't get in the book? You know, and maybe give us some examples of, of how you use it with your clients to, to bring it to life. Sure. So the, the first three months are really pretty eye-opening. Um because we spend a lot of time on discipline and accountability because that's usually where the founders get frustrated, right? Because they, they just think they're just not executing. My team can't execute. Uh, we can't ever get anything done. <laughs> and so we're always firefighting. And when we get down to those first three days, it's really creating a strong foundation of discipline and accountability. And it starts with really structuring the organization with the accountability chart so everybody's crystal clear on what their function is and what their role is within that function. Because too many times, so many they're wearing too many hats yeah. and, and they're always stepping on each other's toes and they don't know where their role ends and the other one starts. And so there's a lot of drop balls. There's a lot of miscommunications. And when we go through that process of clarifying the accountability chart, you know, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of conflict that happens in that discussion because when we go through that process, I tell them, okay, when we go through this exercise, nobody owns a seat in this room right now. Okay. You really have to de- detach yourself from your role and you're really acting as a board of directors. We don't look at titles. You don't look at your specific, what you've done in the past, you know, what seat you're in right now for the greater good of the company. What is the right structure for the organization that's going to create clear accountability? And so we start that process and, and people are surprised at, um, you know, what kind of conflict comes out of that? Because people are so territorial about their position and their title and their seat that they don't want to let go of things um, until they start really getting that mindset. Okay, for the greater good of the company, I really have to detach myself from this, this role. If I were to structure this, you know, as a board of directors, what would be the right structure for the greater good that's going to get us to the next level? Because the structure that got us here may not necessarily be the, the right structure that's going to get us to the next level. Yeah, and, and Don, do you believe that there can be two MDs in a company or does there really <laughs> need to be one, especially when you've got two partners that are running the business? Yeah, so we, we have two functions really at the top, the visionary and the integrator, okay? And, and there's not always a visionary, but there always has to be an integrator. 
And the integrator is really the one that runs the day-to-day aspect of the business. They love that side of the business. Um, and sometimes the visionary sits in that integrator seat because they have the foresight to start the business, right? They had that vision to start the business. And then they had to run the business because they couldn't afford you know, someone else to run it for them. And so, and that's great. They, they can grow the business to a certain degree, but then once the business starts really growing, and they're just not wired that way. They don't love the day-to-day aspect of things. They, they don't have the details. They'd rather be more visionary and looking forward instead of handling the day-to-day aspects of the business. That's where they get stuck. And that's where they really need to find out if they, if they truly want to be the visionary where they add the most value to the organization, they need to let go and have someone else run that business for them. Um, and that's where the integrator is really critical in that role. And usually when, when a visionary see, finds the, the right integrator or the true integrator for their business, that's when it takes, takes them to the next level and they skyrocket. Um, and so the visionary and integrator relationship is, is very key in making sure that those two are always on the same page yeah. because they can't, both of them can't run the business on a day-to-day aspect or there are, it's, it's going to be like, um, we always equate uh, parenting analogies to, to running the business because the parents have to be aligned, right? Because if they're not on the same page, then what happens? The, the kids divide and conquer, right? So same thing with the leadership team. If the visionary and the integrator are not on the same page, then they're gonna, the, the leadership team and the rest of the organization is going to divide and conquer and go to the one that they want to hear from and get the answer that they want to hear instead of just they have one voice. If they have one voice, then the integrator basically can speak for both of them. So yeah, I think that's, that's so, so true. And, uh, you know, I ran a tech consulting business and it was, I knew it was a perfect partnership, whereas I'm more the strategy, the visionary guy. And mm-hmm. then, uh, Scott, my business partner, was very much the implementer. And it was great because we had clear lines. Um, I suppose the one that marketing sometimes is the hardest to, to separate because it's got a combination of both, you know, which roles... Yes typical which functions do you find hardest to separate in in businesses well you know that accountability chart you could be sitting in two different seats sometimes you might be sitting in three depending on the size of the organization so the visionary can also be sitting in the marketing seat because they're they're more of the relationship type uh, person and they they like the business development aspect of the business uh, but they need to know what seat they're sitting whenever they're making decisions Okay, because if they're if they're making the marketing decisions, they're sitting in that marketing function. Okay, not necessarily in the visionary seat, and they still have to honor what the integrator is making sure that because the integrator is looking at the whole entire big picture, making sure all the functions are working really well, and not just specifically just the marketing seat. Because the marketing seat uh, leader might be really bent on. On, on marketing campaigns and things like that, but you know, how does that how does that impact operationally? You know, can we actually service all those clients that you're you're de- you're developing uh, this business for? And also financially, you know, does it make sense financially to 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 do what that marketing person wants? And so the integrator is really making sure that all those seats are well represented and making sure that that team is communicating well together. Um, so if that visionary is sitting in that marketing seat. They're not at that visionary seat. They're sitting in that marketing seat with that hat. Yeah, great. And Does that makes sense. Yeah. And what happens if someone new comes into the team? How, how, do you, how do they quickly learn and understand the roles and responsibilities? Like, you know, how's it documented? How do you go back and review it? Just, you know, what are some uh, things that you do in that regard? So you're saying if a new team member comes in to the leadership team? Yeah. Like yeah. They know? I sit down and I say, well, look, this is who does what in the business. Like, how? You know, is there, you know, do you have a, I don't know, like a Miro board? Do you have a, you know, a document? Like, you know, how, how is it described on who does what? Got it. So the accountability chart is that description. So it's, it's a very simplified tool that basically shows what their function is. And we don't focus on titles. So their function might be head of marketing, right? They're, they're the marketing function. And within that, within that function, in that box, in that accountability chart, so if you think of a traditional org chart, Yes. It's similar to that, yes. but an org chart really is more of a reporting mechanism. It doesn't really show what the specific roles and responsibilities are under function. Um, so we, we we prefer an accountability chart. So within that function, we have you know three to five, I mean, sometimes seven key roles and responsibilities in that function, which is really the highest level of their job description. If you were to simplify their job description, what would be the three to five, maybe seven key roles and responsibilities that they own that they're accountable for? All right. And so you really hire towards that instead of because the, 
the trap that people get into, especially as you're growing, is that um, you know sometimes people just hire people and then you figure out where to put them. But then you're not hiring for that function anymore. And for the greater good of the company, you really need that function and you need someone that's really great at those key roles and responsibilities within that function. And so if you're not hiring towards that, then you're you're creating another you're creating a monster in your organization where no one's really clear on what they're accountable for, um, and so all of a sudden all these different functions and and jobs start popping up, even though it's not for the greater good of the company because we're we're settling for our our existing strengths and weaknesses or the weakness the strengths and weaknesses of the people that we hire instead of what we really need for the organization based on that accountability chart. Does that yeah. make sense? Yeah. Because we always. We always go to we we emphasize structure first, then people. Because if you have the right structure, then you start hiring the right people to fit that structure. Um, because too many times we may not have the right person to put in that seat, and then we hit a ceiling because we're we're um, we're not getting the best person that we call it GWCs that seat. GWC get it, they want it, have capacity to fill that seat. So we're always working towards. Um, each of those functions to be the pe- best person that gets it once it has capacity to fill that seat. Great. Well, I'm just going to ask you one more question in the build section, and it's around numbers, right? I know that you had a finance mm-hmm. background. That was your, you know, in corporate, you did finance before you moved in your own business. What What are the essential numbers? So if I had to say to you, you know, like, you know, we sit down at a, one of your board um, peer board meetings and, and what are the absolute critical numbers that someone needs to know to run their business well? Um, I mean, it ranges all over the place. So, so I mean, the obvious ones are financial, right? Because sometimes a lot of people know what their top line is. Yeah. And, um, and, but most of the time, I wouldn't say most, but uh, there are a lot of the times they don't know what their bottom line is and not just the bottom line for the whole entire company, but on a product basis or for a service basis, you know, what, what products or services are actually making you money? Where are you having the highest margin? Because they don't have that granularity. They just they just look at the bottom line overall. And if they're at two percent or at ten percent, you know what products are at forty percent that that uh, and what products are at zero percent that's bringing that forty percent down to that ten percent average. And so when you start really digging deeper into okay, how do we make this product? And when we deliver this product. What what actual margin do we have on this? That's one of the things that really is eye opening for some people because they don't really look at at the on a, a per product or per per uh, per service margin. And then from that is you know the the leading indicators or the activities that lead to that, whether it's the sales and marketing productivity. Because I look at three three different metrics. Um, one is called uh, productivity, and it could be sales productivity or operational productivity. Okay, so it could be sales productivity on terms of, you know, how how are you generating leads, how are you closing business, how many clients are you getting. Uh, operational productivity is, you know, how are we serving our clients, um, how are we delivering our services, uh, how many products are we getting out, uh, and things like that. So that's productivity. And then the second one is a risk or quality metric, because you could be re- highly productive, but then you're sacrificing quality, or you're taking on too much risk. Right, so you're having a lot of errors. You're having a lot of returns. You're having a lot of mistakes and refunds. So that's a quality issue. Or you're taking on too much risk, where you're you're taking on clients that you shouldn't take, and they're not able to pay you. So your 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 receivables are growing, and and that's a risk on its own. Um, or your your um, say your on time delivery suffering, because you're taking on too many clients, you can't serve them in the time frame that you want to, and all of a sudden your products are taking a lot longer or your services are taking a lot longer to, to accomplish. And then the last thing is financial. And if you're doing everything productively really well, and if you're managing your risk and quality really well, then it should pop out in your financials, right? So your financial strength uh, should be um, uh, should be good. And it, like I said, it goes beyond just revenue. It could be revenue per employee, could be profit per employee, profit per product, profit per service. So if you focus on those three things, productivity, risk slash quality, and then financial, you, you kind of have a balanced scorecard, if you will, looking at the, the all sides of the business. Um, because at the other side of that is you can be so quality and risk averse that your productivity is suffering, right? You're not getting anything out the door. 
because you want it to be perfect, but then your productivity suffering. So you have to balance all that out to make sure you're looking at all parts of the business. Brilliant. Well, we'll listen to Don Maranka and uh, you can go to jdsmenterprises.com to find out more. And we're going to have him back in one moment, but I'm just going to ask you if you have a sales system to reach your next million. So Don has been talking a lot about, you know, those key measures. And I think that productivity and sales in particular, a lot of businesses I work with have done brilliantly to get to their first million through referrals and really, you know, working incredibly hard. But then the next million, they know they can't get there. So I've got some questions that I always ask my clients that really help them set up their sales system. And you can go and get those. You can go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash pulse. And if you also go to the homepage, it'll be there at paulhigginsmentoring.com. And you fill out, there's nine questions. It'll take you about three minutes, but those questions can be life-changing for you and for the business. So paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash Pulse. So the next next section, Don, is the live section. And what are some daily habits, right? That might not be EOS related, but some daily habits that help you be successful. So daily habits. So I always start my day with a prayer. That really grounds me before I start the day and before my my whole day and my mind gets cluttered. It gets kind of centers me, right? Um, and then you know, one of the other things is, is, is really honoring my commitments. And I, I use a, a, a Dan Sullivan approach of, from Strategic Coach, and he organizes his days as focus days, buffer days, and free days. And uh, the focus days are really when you're, you're producing, um, you're, you're serving your client really well. You're just focused on that, um, and that's where you're generating your revenue. The buffer days are kind of the administrative days and trying to take care of other things that help you with the focus days and generating more income. And then free days is really your free days, your free time with, with your family, your vacations, or if you're, if you, if you run every day, or if you exercise, you know, really protecting those. And so one of my commitments is to make sure when I'm scheduling things that I, I, I plan ahead of in advance on how many buffer days, how many focus days I have and how many free days I have for the whole year. And so if I don't honor that, then it messes up, um, it messes up my, my whole system. And, and my family starts feeling it. I start feeling it. My clients start yeah. feeling it. And so I have to make sure I honor that. And another thing is um, really, I, I, I always commit to bringing my best, uh, like, especially when I'm praying in the morning. It's like, yeah, how do I bring my best? Uh, because if I'm not bringing my best, I'm not being my best for my clients. I'm not being my best for my team. And at the end of the day, I always ask myself, okay, where did I fail in becoming my best? So I kind of look back to see, okay, how can I improve upon that? Or is there something I need to, do I need to apologize to somebody or, or, you know, whether it's my family or my clients or my team, you know, I, I want to make sure I'm, I'm always bringing my best. Great. And, and across the, you know, focus buffer and free days, you know, is it an even split? Do you look at doing, you know, a third each or, you know, do you weight it some other way when you look at that year plan? So when I look at the year plan, so say, you know, I, I have about uh, half of my time is free days and the other half is, um, is the buffer and the focus days, right? Yeah. But that includes weekends. When you look at the weekends, right, that, that, so my free days, so I have about, say, roughly about 150 free days on my calendar, which includes weekends and about um, when, you, when you spread it over time, about two months. Of, of free days um, of vacation time. Um, not all at the same time, obviously, but, you know, at different times of the year. And then I have my, my, my focus days and my buffer days that make up the rest of the days of the year. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, the next section is the give section and what's a, a charity or community that you support and why? You know, I really have three passions. Um, one is uh, multiple sclerosis. So my sister-in-law has MS and uh, and we do an annual ride for for a fundraising the MS150, which is a two day ride, and typically it goes over 150 miles and over those two days, and so we we help raise money for multiple sclerosis for a cure for her because uh, she she's a, a great part of our family, and we want to make sure that they're always uh, working towards a cure for that. The other two things are related to my boys. So I have uh, I have two boys. They're both adopted. So I have a passion for adoption. So anytime I can help a uh, uh, a charity that's related to adoption. We do that. And also my oldest son, Jake has dyslexia. 
So we, we contribute to uh, things like his school and for, for, um, uh, for purposes that, that help with dyslexics. And so those really are my three passions and they're, they're very near, near and dear to our, our hearts because we have very personal connections to them. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, the, the last, last section is the rapid fire section where I'll ask you some questions and you give me some rapid fire responses. So the first one is, what is a piece of technology that you can run your business without? <laughs> So a couple, a couple of them. So one of them is called Traction Tools, and it's very specific to EOS. So for, run, for companies that are running on EOS, it just really helps us put all the tools in that one software. It helps us stay on track with the priorities, our to-dos, our ROGs, our VTO, which is our vision. So that's one thing. And all, my whole team uses that to make sure we're all aligned and, and executing really well towards our vision. And the other thing is related to what I talked about with the, the free days, the buffer days, and and uh, and the focus days is really my calendar. Because <laughs> if my calendar is not is not working well, I'm completely lost. And so I, I just use Outlook 365, and uh, I have a team member that helps me manage my calendar to make sure that I'm I'm protecting the times that I need to protect. But my calendar is key, and that that helps me a lot. Great. So. The next is what is your best sales tip? Best sales tip. So it's not really sales when you're educating people, right? So my style is really to educate people. I don't consider myself as a salesperson, but I like to educate people. And it's really just giving your knowledge away. Because when you do that, you educate people. People want to do business with you. They, they see value in, in what you do and what you're communicating with them. And that just naturally, it tends to result in a sale. And, and you may not even be intentional about it, but if you're intentional by educating them, and, and really sharing what you have and, and how to help them. Um, uh, you don't have to worry about sales. It just comes to you when you're just educating. Right. Well, I know you said that you've got the EOS where you go and you know, sharpen the saw, but where else do you look for expertise to help you grow your business? You know, a couple of things. So my, my business has both two sides, a uh, tab business, which is a peer board model, if you're all familiar with that, and EOS, which is for the leadership team. So the, the tab side of things are, is just for the business owners. And so I look to my clients because when I, when I run these meetings with the tab boards, the peer groups, I learn so much from my clients because they're all owners. We're all sharing wisdom from, with one another to see how we can run our business better. So I, run, I learn from them. Also, when I'm doing my EOS sessions with the leadership team, I'm learning so much with them. So I learn a lot from my, my clients. Um, I do have my own T group, which is called the Traction Group. Uh, which is my own peer group for EOS implementers. And I learn from them how do we run our EOS practices much better. I have my own personal coach as well. Actually, my 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 wife and I, because she's in the business, so it's a family business. So we have a coach that coaches both of us on how we run our business better. And also sometimes it becomes more of a marriage counseling type thing too. So, <laughs> um, And then lastly, I look to my team, just like my, my, uh, my clients with EOS, they lean on their leadership team to gain knowledge, to make sure how they work together and get a better business, healthier business. I lean on my team as well to make sure that we're growing and we're developing personally as well as professionally um, in our business. So, right. And, and, and what's, you know, the last question is, you know, what, piece of advice would you like to leave us with? Piece of advice. It probably goes back to that clarity. Like I said, I always focus on clarity, accountability, and growth, but it starts with that clarity. Because if you're not clear on where you want to go, whether personally or also in your business, you're not going to get there. And it's, it doesn't count if you just have it in your head. Write it down. Because when you visit that you know, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, you, you can see how much you've grown or haven't grown. And, and so you can really ho start holding yourself accountable. And it's even more magical when you share it with people, because if you write it down and then you share it with people, studies have shown that the, the, um, the realization of that vision exponentially increases when you write it down and then you share it, it increases even more because it increases that accountability. So that's my biggest piece of advice is in order for to get that clarity is get it written and then you share it with some people. Yeah, brilliant. Well, look, it's been such a pleasure having you on, Don. And for everyone watching or listening, or both, you can go to jdsmenterprises.com and there he's got a, a health check. So um, it's called the org checkup. I just had to make sure I got that right. But it's uh, the org checkup. You can find it there on the website and it really helps to see if you've got the key things 
that are helping you to be a healthy business. But uh, wonderful having you on, as I said, Don, and uh, thanks for sharing your wisdom today. Thank you so much, Paul. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed that interview as much as I did with Don. He shared a lot of value. And as I said at the start, it was pulling out parts of EOS, which you will not read in the book. And, you know, off air, he was talking about how he's really the doctor for business. So you go to a doctor for your general health, you go for a doctor like an EOS implementer like Don to look at your business health. And then he refers specialists in for specific things. But, you know, it's a great system. If you get the chance or if you haven't read it, go read Traction from Gino Wickman. But please look up Don on jdsmenterprises.com. And all the links will be in the show notes as well. And if you want to really work out if you've got the right sales system to get you to your next million, in revenue, just go to paulhigginsmentoring.com forward slash pulse. Please take action to build, live, and give. Thanks for listening to the Build, Live, Give podcast. If you like what you heard, please share it and leave us a review. It would mean the world to us.